So today I'm going to be talking about um, these, these so-called hybrid FPGA GPU systems, um, particularly in reference to what we use at the long wavelength array at our, our new Sevieta station. Um, so the overview of the talk here, I'm going to talk about these systems, you know, what are they, what are they to me, um, and provide a concrete example, as I mentioned, of, of the LWA. Um, and then I'm going to move on to talking about this framework here, Bifrost, that we use for actually getting all this to get getting all of this together, getting the data from the FPGA onto the servers and into the GPUs where we do all of our computing. Um, and then I want to shift gears a little bit and talk, you know, kind of more generally about how you actually would think about designing um, a hybrid system, uh, the design, cons the, design the considerations, um, and things you need to think about that. And then I want to move into um, what I call tips, tuning, and pitfalls, so various things that, that we've learned deploying this at Sevieta which I think might be useful to, to a wider audience trying to do these kind of systems. And then I'm just going to finish up with a look towards the future. This is both for uh, Bifrost, the framework, as well as uh, the LWA. Um, so to get started, you know, these hybrid systems, which were brought up yesterday as being popular for correlators, um, are exactly what they, they claim to be. They're, they're a mixture of FPGAs and GPUs to handle the, the combined DSP you need to accomplish whatever your instrument's doing. Um, so the typical division you see is that FPGAs are very good for IO, limited, IO things, so you want to do all your time domain aspects here, um, typically conversion to frequency domain using either an FFT or a PFB uh, to get frequency domain data. And then you hand these off to your GPUs where you do your subsequent processing, so your beam forming, your correlation, um, your real-time trigger detection, whatever you want to do. Um, and then the other key thing is that you need some kind of network to connect these two different components together to shuttle the data. Um, if you wanted to draw kind of a cartoon diagram of what this would look like, you know, you have your antennas out here, and you have your digitizers and an FPGA here, and there's some network that connects it to this um, computing cluster here. And then each of these computing nodes runs a pipeline which captures the packets and puts it into some kind of memory buffer um, where downstream different blocks, you know, operate on that data, read it in, and then they, they move it around. And then at some point, you um, put it out. Um, the other interesting thing is that these are also easily amenable to branching pipelines. So if you want to do something new or do something additional, you can just tack on another pipeline here relatively easily. Um, and so this is basically a slide that, that says all that. Um, so one of the things I, I like to think about here is that in this way, you know, the FPGA kind of becomes kind of a, a static, you know, almost appliance on, on your instrument, you know. It does one thing and it does it very well. It can packetize your data, put timestamps on it, and get it out to your servers. And so then that allows you to shift a lot of your development effort into the server side, uh, the GPU side, um, which I think has a lot of advantages for testing because you can take your pipelines and easily break them down. You can write unit tests. You can do a variety of things, which I'll talk about. Um, I think this also gets you a wider developer base. I think it's, it's a lot easier to find people that are familiar with C, C++, CUDA, and all these various APIs. Um, and it also gives you a wider ecosystem you know, beyond astronomy. You can find additional packages that implement similar things uh, and then work on porting those to your particular environment. Um, so that's kind, of a, that's kind of a theoretical overview there. Um, for the purpose of this talk, my example here is the advanced digital processor at the Long Wave Array Sevieta station. Um, so here we have an overview of the station. So we have this 100 meter aperture filled with uh, 256 dipole antennas. You can see one of them here. They're about five feet tall or so. Uh, with dual polarization, and they operate over 5 to 88 megahertz. Um, and all of these are cabled up to this electronic shelter here. Um, and inside the electronic shelter, we have, we have all the magic. So the signals come into this analog rack, which gains up and filters the signals. And then the signals are piped over CAT7 cables into this set of 16 roach boards, which does the digitization and the F engine. And that data is packetized, sent to the switch and to this bank of seven uh, GPU servers here. Um, and this is kind of an idea of what we use it for. I don't expect everyone to read this slide because there's a lot up here, but the main points I want to make are that LWA science, you know, really spans the history of the universe. So from the first stars and the cosmic dark ages all the way down to lightning happening within tens of kilometers of the station. Um, and so the science case really drives the kind of flexibility that we need inside the LWA system. And the other point um, is that everything on LWA is open sky. So if you have an idea, you know, we have yearly proposal calls. 
if you just want to test something, you know, we are always happy to give out discretionary time for maybe 10, 12 hours to test things out. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the shift system, shifting gears here a little bit to talk about the framework that we use to actually make all this happen and enable all these different kinds of science. Um, our framework is called Bifrost. So in North Myth Norse mythology, Bifrost is the rainbow bridge that connects Midgard, the world of humans, to Asgard, the land of, of the gods. Um, and similarly, Bifrost connects GPUs, I mean CPUs, the lands of humans, to the high compute density world of the GPU gods, where we can do a lot of compute on some data. Um, and so this is written um, in C++ and Python. Uh, so we have all of our performance critical stuff in C++, and then we wrap it in Python to make it a little bit easier to deal with. Um, it's referenced here in this JAI paper by Cranmer et al. if you want the details uh, for how things are implemented and, and a little bit better overview. Um, the other important thing is that all of our GPU support is done through CUDA, so we target NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and then the functionality is still growing. You know, we're, We've done things that we need for the LWA, um, and we think that we provide a, a good general basis, but there are, of course, gaps in the functionality. There are other things that people want to do that we haven't thought of because we haven't directly needed to do it. Um, and all of our software is, is open source, so you can find us on GitHub under Lita Telescope Bifrost. You could also search for lead a telescope by frost. Um, and we have all the code here. We have issues, pull requests, things like that. Um, we actually have a few people that are, that are currently working on by frost and trying to adapt it uh, to what they are using. Um, so that's this kind of an overview of by frost there. Um, looking at some of the concepts, some of the terminology that I'll use um, throughout the talk. So the first thing are blocks. So these, these gray squares here are blocks, and so these are, these are independent threads. These are black box kind of algorithms. So these are things that do things to your data. Um, and the blocks are connected by these, these ring buffers, circular buffers. Uh, I'll just call them rings, uh, which emulate some kind of wraparound memory, and they allow you to move data between the different blocks. Uh, the other thing about the rings is they are assigned to a specific space, so that's where the memory lives. Um, here we have two spaces. The CPU space, so these are all CPU-based rings, and then there's the GPU space, and so these are GPU-based rings. And so the Bifrost rings can live on, on either side or on, on any of these spaces, which makes memory management a lot easier for shuffling data on and off the GPUs. Uh, and then the pipeline is just the combination of all of these pieces put together, so the blocks and the corresponding rings that connect everything. Uh, looking closer at a ring, I have a kind of a schematic of, of what it looks like. So there's this, there's this active write area here, and so this, this area is locked for writing. And then it progresses this way, and then we loop over in the ghost region. And so this gives us our kind of continuous memory space, uh, which appears of infinite size for stream processing. And then you have various reading processes that can lock these different chunks here. Uh, so one of the key things here is that this framework supports multiple readers, so you can have like a data capture process right to your ring, and then you can have multiple independent processes read from that ring and perform different operations on the same data. Um, because we, we like threading, you know, everything here is, is thread safe, so you have uh, thread safe access to the memory to make sure that you don't accidentally overwrite your memory, and then everything can be allocated in these different spaces, um, so you can have standard system memory, standard CUDA memory, and something called CUDA host, which is this pinned CPU memory, which is, is locked into um, the host memory and cannot be swapped out, which has some nice performance benefits. Um, the unique things to say about this ring is that you can really read and write at any location with inside uh, the ring here, so long as it's not locked by the writing process. So different rings can read overlapping sections, disparate sections, um, things like that. We also support something called ringlets, which allow you to view the data inside your ring buffer, uh, basically processed along a different axis, or presented to you along a different axis, which can help with some kinds of uh, data processing. We have something called the guarantee, the Bifrost guarantee. That means that if you don't want your data overwritten at any time while you're using it, Bifrost will create a lock on that particular part of memory and ensure that no process can write to it while someone is reading it. And this is a good way to guarantee data integrity inside a pipeline. Um, and then the big things that I really like are all the rings are, are metadata rich. 
and they support multiple sequence. So a sequence, um, for the purpose of this, is a continuous span of data, which has the same kind of observing parameters, so tuning frequency, channel count, etc. And so this continues along in various what we call spans, which are discrete chunks of time, until, you know, something changes about the observing, and then that sequence ends, and another sequence starts. And so every time you have this change in the observing parameters, it triggers um, this new sequence, and there's associated metadata with it that you can keep up with and propagate down your pipelines so that you always know what you're doing, what you're looking at, what you're, what you're actually processing. Um, getting into the design here, um, so as I mentioned, it's a Python front end around C++ and CUDA code. So for the front end, we have all of these Python objects, um, which are abstractions of the, the underlying C++ and CUDA code. So you build everything you have in Python, um, and then we wrap all of our underlying calls in C types. So you have kind of the simplicity and readability of like a Python script with the speed that you would expect from this kind of C, C++, CUDA framework. Um, and we also try to do all of our memory management with this object called an ND array, uh, which is very similar to what you have in NumPy. So if you read a ring, it's not some, just some memory range that you have. You can actually interpret it and work with it inside the Python environment. Um, on the back end, of course, we have these ring buffers, which I've talked extensively about, which we use to move data between the different blocks. And then we have this, this object called a BF array, which is our genetic data, uh, data structure. So this is the, the C++ version, the C++ version of what the ND array is. And this wraps um, a lot of information about your data, shape, sizes, uh, things like that. And we also have implemented uh, several common modules, which we think are useful for, for doing processing. Um, so at the very highest level, this is, this is what a Bifrost pipeline can look like. Um, so you start off with this kind of pipeline instance, and then you add these different blocks here. Here's a block, here's a block, block, block. And then they have inputs and outputs. And so what happens is you add all this together inside this pipeline context, and at the end you say pipeline.run, and it figures out based on the structure of the blocks how to put everything together and what rings to use. And then you kind of immediately have you a pipeline that's already structured there. Um, if you want to look at what's inside one of these blocks, they're relatively simple things. So the starting block is a, is a test block, and so it creates a, it's a data source. And so the two important things here are on sequence. So this is what's triggered when a new sequence hits the ring, and it updates various bits of metadata here. And then we have on data, which is the actual processing, which is what runs through the different spans inside a sequence and does what you want. Uh, the block to do. And then the pipeline instance picks all of this up and compiles it together into a, a pipeline that you can run. Um, below that, if you look at kind of individual blocks and the, and the level that's just above the C++ level, what I call the Python binding level, um, the code is also relatively clean. Uh, so this is just sort of the lightweight wrapper around the C++ call. You initialize it here. We have some nice built-in check functions that allow you to make sure that uh, the underlying C++ code is doing what you want to, and then there's a little bit of boilerplate here for manipulating arrays and putting them in kind of this uh, BF array compatible format. Uh, and so even if you go down to the C++ level, um, I would contend that the syntax here isn't, isn't too daunting or, or too scary. Um, you start off with the definition here. Here we bring in a BF array and we output a BF array, and we do this transpose operation on, on some list of axes. All of this up here is just a boilerplate. You know, this is very basic data validation to make sure that you've been given data that can actually uh, be worked on. It, it doesn't make much sense to transpose a 1D array. Um, and you want to be able to, to work on a CUDA space. And then you, you can use the BF array. It's got information about the data types, the number of dimensions, and, and the shapes of each of those dimensions. Uh, so that's kind of the idea of, of what Bifrost looks like uh, going back to, to what I think some of the advantages are of Bifrost and this, this kind of framework, the metadata is, is very powerful. This is, this is one of the things I really like about it. And so you can, you can embed units in things, um, you can embed in dimensions, um, time scales, things like that. And so this could be very helpful for downstream blocks. You know, if you want to, if you want to do some kind of dispersion, it's nice to know what your channel width is and what your central frequencies are for each of the channels. 
um, the multi-sequence aspects of the ring buffers are very useful for different types of observations. At LWA Sevieta, you know, the observers control the setup of the instrument, so the tunings change, the frequency change, everything moves around. And so having this metadata-rich ring structure and the ability to segregate data based on its parameters is generally very helpful for keeping up what's going on. And we can, of course, propagate all of this down the pipeline. Um, from a usability standpoint, you know, ND array, which I've talked about, is a subclass of the NumPy ND array. So that gives you compatibility with many of the NumPy functions, gives you ability to plot all of your data in matplotlib. And so this is really great for debugging. You know, if something's going wrong in your pipeline, you're not getting the answer you want, you can stick in a matplotlib call somewhere. You can look at your data, you can dump it to a file and check it later. It's very helpful. Everything is time tagged, so we can keep track of time inside the rings. Um, Again, this is useful for kind of transient work, you know. You say you have a triggering system and you know what time your transient occurred. You can go back into the ring and pull out that particular span of time, provided it is within the realm um, of time that the ring can hold. And then again, we have, we have several things in here uh, to help people do astronomy and just general processing, things that we found that we've needed with the LWA. Uh, and so here's just a list of some of the blocks that we have. Um, I want to point out particularly something we call map. So there's this Bifrost map block. Uh, and it's basically an easy way for you to take just some kind of general C++ code um, and convert it to a uh, CUDA kernel on the fly and then run it. So we use NVIDIA's real-time compiler here to compile this. So in this little example, we make this small array, um, which lives on the GPU, another small array, a result array, and then we just call bf.map, and that allows us to add the two arrays and put the result into this third array. And this, this is very helpful just for prototyping and seeing what's going on. Um, and all of these compiled results are, are, results are cached and available for the duration of the run of the pipeline. So you get, you get a little bit of performance hit the first time as it's compiled, and then after that, uh, much better performance as you just use the cast version on the GPU. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I really want to talk about that I, I really like about Bifrost is we have a lot of built-in logging and performance benchmarking. So inside each block, you can have uh, various log points that dump what's going on and give you some idea of the state of your system. And then we can collect these all together, and we have utilities. Um, here's one here. It's called like top. It's like top, <laughs> as the name implies. And so it gives you an overview of what's happening inside your pipeline. So there are three different pipelines running here. And so this is by PID and by the individual blocks. And so it gives you information about core bindings, CPU usage, and then these three columns that are uh, acquire, process, and reserve give you insight into what each of the blocks is doing. Reserve is the amount of time it takes for a block to acquire data. Process is the processing time. And reserve is the time required to um, uh, allocate some space in the output buffer and output data. And so this is very helpful for, de for debugging because you can kind of see what's going on. You can understand where your pipeline is slow um, and kind of get this real-time sense of what's going on. And it's, it's very useful for, for debugging. Uh, so that's kind of what we have for Bifrost. I just want to switch gears a little bit here and, and talk about, you know, actually building a hybrid system. Um, this is possibly more like a, a systems engineering talk, but I think it's kind of helpful for people to see what you need to consider when you're building these systems, because there are some, some critical things in here, particularly like the power and thermal budget that people really need to uh, take into account when they are, are designing these things. Um, so as was mentioned yesterday, you really need to define your problem. You know, it's very hard to know when you've had success when you don't know what you're doing. Um, and so you really want to go back to the science and say, what is the science driving us? You know, what is critical? What do we really need to do the science that we want to do? Um, what would be nice? There's always some kind of fringe science that would be nice to have, but it's not necessarily critical to your proposal or your, um, or your overall program. And then you want to look at what kind of flexibility and expandability uh, you want in there. Because uh, in the future, you know, there will be another generation of hardware. Things will be faster. Things will be easier to do, and you may want to be able to enable that flexibility to do additional processing and, and enable additional science that you haven't thought of now. Uh, and the main point here is, is you shouldn't be afraid to break your problem into parts, you know. If you have a sufficiently complicated system, it is better if you break it into parts and so that you can, you know, really target what you really need to do your science first and not get bogged down with things that are nice to have but not necessarily critical. 
Um, Next thing is that these hybrid systems, when you, when you start to involve servers and GPUs, you begin to really start wondering about power usage um, and thermal load. So GPUs are particularly power hungry. Um, so you can, I think the new RTXs have a cap of like 200 or 250 watts each. So you can, you can definitely burn some power if you're starting to really load up your GPUs. And so you really need to be able to, one, make sure that you can actually deal with this power, and two, that you can deal with the heat coming out of it. Um, in a lot of these astronomy applications, you know, um, radio frequency interference, especially self-generated, is, is a big concern. So you will ideally want to have these in some kind of shielded rack, you know, and you want to be able to know that you can actually dissipate the amount of heat that you're putting into that rack and get it out so that you don't uh, toast all of your hardware before you really do anything with it. Um, and this may impact how you actually deal with the design and how you break it down, you know. So if you find that you would like to have if you'd really like to have twice as much bandwidth going in, but you find out that you can't actually dissipate that much heat or provide that much power to a rack, then, then you really should consider scaling back and trying some kind of half bandwidth level uh, before moving forward. Um, and this can also drive you to make decisions um, on the overall system. Like maybe you have to switch to water cooling in order to get the kind of heat dissipation you need inside a single wrap, which can uh, impact other parts of the overall design. Uh, then we have hardware selection here. Um, so obviously you need to talk about your servers and your GPUs. So you need to think about things like core count, uh, how much memory you need, think about which kind of rings you have, how much data you want to be able to buffer into those rings. Um, and you want to talk, think about storage, you know, are you going to transmit your data when you're done processing it to another machine or are you going to try to record it locally? And that impacts their I.O. bandwidth. Um, so you have to get the data from your network card onto your GPU, and that's typically going to involve something like a PCIe bus, you know. And so do you have enough bandwidth on your server to actually move that data and to support everything you want to do in all of the data transmits? Um, more recently, this could also influence, you know, your kind of processor you pick. You know, so the recent AMD processors have better support um, for the newer generation PCI Express things, so this may drive you to a particular processing architecture. Um, and then power capacity, you know, you can't, you can't put in four, you know, of the latest generation's GPUs into some tiny desktop machine that has a 300 watt power supply. It's just not going to work. And so you need to make sure that whatever servers you have, have enough power capacity and have enough cooling capacity to actually support what you're putting inside them. Um, and the networking, you need, you need to talk, is it 10 gig, is it 40 gig, is it 100 gig? What exactly are you going to use? Um, we have accelerator libraries here, so some manufacturers like Mellanox provide you accelerator libraries, which can give you better performance uh, when pulling packets off of your network interface and getting them shuffled to the CPU. And so these kind of things are very helpful when deploying. And then, of course, um, I put up here familiarity. You know, in, in the case of it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know, it's, it's usually better to go with the devil you know because you know what to expect. You have some idea of what's going to be needed down the road when you're trying to really push the performance and really tune the system. And so I, I wouldn't discount familiarity as, as an important part here. Uh, beyond the hardware, there's monitor and control. Um, this is a big thing that I, I really like to harp on here, is that you really need a monitor and control system. You both need to control your system and be able to monitor it. With these hybrid systems, you have the network, you have the FPGAs, you have the GPUs, you have the servers. There's a lot of parts that you that need to work together and you really need to know that everything is working as it should be um, so that you can assuring that you're getting valid data out and it also really helps you um, really identify how everything should act and help you identify problems in real time when, when you do have those uh, and then it's really easier to build in monitor control at the beginning than try to retrofit it into a system so if you are building a system I encourage you to put in all those monitoring hooks and all those control hooks from the get-go because it's a lot easier when it's already there than to try to, to build it in after the fact. Uh, and then, then the final design consideration is something I just kind of vaguely call the software stack. You know, this is not just your data, you know, capture your pipelining system, but you should also really consider the end users, you know. Eventually you will create this data and it will be great that your system's running. But if no one uses it, you know, it's what is kind of the point? Because these are all, you know, instruments designed to do science. And so you need to enable people to actually do those science. So you need to think about, you know, how to read the data, what kind of metadata to provide. And I kind of lump this in there because I think this is also something that, that some people overlook. They get very excited about building these systems and making them work and achieving, you know, X gigabits per second. But at the end of the day, if no one can use it, you know, it's, 
Good job. You made a, a system that's theoretical. Yay. Um, uh, so just kind of talking about the process, um, getting a little, little more specific about what we had at LWA. Um, a lot of the, the design considerations were relatively easy because we were driven by compatibility with the existing LWA digital processor archetype architecture. So we wanted time domain beams for our outputs. We needed some kind of all dipole mode that was able to give us signals from all of the dipoles continuously for imaging the sky. And then our power usage um, and thermal dissipations were capped by the shelter design at a few kilowatts. Um, and so we ended up deciding on these Roach 2s with these ADT16 boards. Um, we have this 1040 gigabit network here, and then we have seven dual socket, dual GPU servers that do all of the processing. Um, similarly, our monitoring control interface is dictated by existing LWA stations. So this is both the external command interface, the commands that we need to support, as well as some of the internal monitoring, because the monitoring control framework has this overall status keyword. And so you would like that to mean something. If it says normal, you actually would want to. That means that everything on your system is operating within parameters and everything is good. And so you need to have the kind of monitoring that allows you to make that kind of very, you know, high system level, everything's okay. Um, and then we use Bifrost for our software, for our software for the framework. Um, in many ways, you know, Bifrost was driven by LWA and LWA was driven by what we can do with Bifrost. And so they're kind of um, commingled here as to how things were developed and, and what things went into Bifrost. Um, being able to use the Python bonding to throw out that you can have things like zero MQ for your inner pipeline communication. So for like moving configuration information between pipelines or sending command information. You can have, you can leverage kind of these existing packages um, to help with things like that. Okay, and so just a brief rundown of what we have inside the pipeline. So we have seven servers, and so six of those servers run three pipelines. So one we have this called, it's TBN, and then we have 2x DRX. So TBN is a very simple pipeline. It stands for transient buffer narrow, and this is one of our compatibility modes. Uh, so you have some roaches, you capture the data, and then you have what we call the T-engine op, which takes your F-engine, your F-frequency domain data, and transforms it back into the time domain, because the TBN product is a time domain complex voltage product from every antenna, uh, which we used for um, post-capture imaging, so we have a real-time imaging system. Um, it's called LWA-TV, and so this was used uh, to make images of the sky, and so one of the interesting things we discovered is, so if you watch this movie, you see this, this thing streak across the sky, um, and this actually turns out to be a meteor. So reflections from meteors have been known for a long time, but what we found is that there's actually self-absorption at the low, uh, self-emission, sorry, at the lowest frequencies from meteors. And so it's not clear what, what's going on here. There's some kind of plasma wave conversion that takes the energy in that plasma and converts it to radio waves. Um, this is one of the interesting discoveries that you can kind of enable with having this relatively low bandwidth product that can view the entire sky. Uh, by low bandwidth, I mean it's, it's 100 kilohertz. Um, and so we also run these two what we call DRX pipelines. So here's this kind of very brief pipeline schematic. It's got a couple of branches I'll talk about. Uh, the first one is the actual DRX mode, so we capture some packets from the roach boards, and then we do a beam forming off. We form two dual polarization beams, and then we retransmit the data for another system. Uh, this is good for pulsars, you know, so here we have a, a representative pulsar here, 0834, that was detected with the Sevieta system. This, we also use this for VLBI-style correlation between the two LWA stations, as well as correlation with the new four-band system on the VLA. Uh, so this is a, a handy mode. Moving over to another branch, uh, this is called the TBF mode, so transient buffer frequency domain. Uh, so what this is, we capture the data and we copy this into a very large ring buffer that holds about five seconds of data in real time. And then we have an online triggering system that can look at for lightning burst inside this. And so when that comes in, we can use the time tagged feature of the Bifost rings to pull out the data that corresponds to that lightning strike. So 50 milliseconds ahead of the strike and 200 milliseconds after that initial trigger. And we have a, a student, Joe Malins, at UNM that's been using this not to necessarily study lightning, but to use it as a probe of the ionosphere. So the lightning flash goes off. It's a broadband emission. You have a direct line of sight to you, but that light also goes up to the ionosphere, bounces off, and comes down. And so because you know the time delay between the two, you can use that to create ionograms and understand what's going on in the ionosphere. 
This also gives you a way to do um, kind of three-dimensional imaging because you have this all-sky view because you have data from all of the different dipoles, so you can you know make an image of the sky at all these different frequencies at this high time resolution and map exactly where that reflection point is. Um, and then the, the final mode here is uh, our correlator mode. So we capture the data again in the same block and we go over to this correlator op, which is an X engine. Um, and so rather than dealing with 100 kilohertz like what we have with TVN, we can now deal with 10 megahertz. And so we can use this to make images of the sky. And if you subtract the background, the steady sky, you see that there's a little extra point here. And then if you look at that, you have this 10 megahertz of bandwidth, which gives you some indication about the spectral index of these, these meteor afterglows. Um, and, and the final pipeline um, runs on the last server, which also handles our monitor and control. And so this is our T engine. So DRX comes in. We do a similar thing with TVN where we go back to the time domain, because that's our primary data format for the LW outputs. And this just uh, does the inverse transform and repackatizes the data to send out to our data recorders. So that's, that's kind of an overview of, of what we have. Um, in the process, we, we learned a lot of things, which I call pipeline pro tips. Uh, so one of the big things that we've learned here is that overheads really matter. You have overheads both in your pipeline and then on your system. You know, you have probably some standard Linux distribution which has multi-user things. There are log rotations and various things that run in the background um, which you need. And so these these pipe up these steel cycles from your pipelines, you know, and, and for data management. You need to, to be aware that they are there. And you can try to limit them, but I don't think you can entirely eliminate them. Um, inside the pipeline, you know, there are various looks ups and pipeline communication. You know, you don't want to design your pipeline such that you are waiting on the answer from some other server before you, you make progress forward, because that's kind of like a recipe for failure there if there's if that packet gets dropped or or whatever. Um, another thing is that the amount of data that you try to process per gulp, so a gulp is kind of like the unit of data that you ingest into a particular block, is an important tuning parameter, you know. Uh, this is both for time usage and for memory usage. So as you go to smaller gulps, you know, overheads inside your pipeline, inside your system begin to matter more. Um, and so that tries to drive you to larger gulp sizes, but at some point, you know, these gulps acquire so much memory. Um, both inside your ring and instantaneously to process it that, that pushes you lower. So there's this kind of a sweet spot that you can find for algorithms in terms of the amount of data you ingest and, and how long it, it takes you to do that. Um, and then uh, the need for this, this high compute per byte ratio. And so GPUs are great once you can get your data onto the card and you have a lot of compute to do. And so that you know, may influence how your, your pipeline is structured because you want to get the minimum amount of data you can onto your GPU and then do as much work as you can on it before you pull anything out to get uh, the best performance. Um, to try to you know, quantify this as a rubric, I, I like to tell people that it's about 90% of your processing time. So if you're trying to move in 50 milliseconds of data, um, you should try to aim for getting all of that work done in about 45 milliseconds so that you know, when the logs rotate, when a student logs in to check on the data or when anything like that happens, that that, that small delay that you can get there can be absorbed by the, the buffers inside the ring and allow you to continue without any kind of packet loss or problems. Um, and then, of course, testing and validation, which is something that I, I, I really try to uh, promote here. I'm, you need to validate both of them separately, you know. And for the GPU side, you also have additional options to do offline validation. Um, you can write unit tests for individual parts of your pipeline and, and put them all together. Um, you can do offline testing. You know, if you have a GPU pipeline, instead of reading from the network, you can read from canned data from a disk. And so you can use this kind of known data set to do all of your validation. You can do validation against external codes if they, you can share a common data format between them. So there's, there's a lot of very powerful testing. Um, and as a side here, this also means that you can use this kind of pipeline code, not just for these online systems, which we're talking about here, uh, but users can also use them to build offline data analysis systems. So if they have some kind of recorded data that they want to work on, they could build it in a framework um, like Bifrost and kind of get that speed here and be able to, to work with it. Um, moving on to the network, networking tuning is, is very important. You're, uh, I hate to break it to you, but you're not going to install Ubuntu desktop on a machine and then immediately be able to process a million packets per second. Um, you're going to need to do some tuning both for the kernel, so there's this syscontrol.conf file 
which gives tuning parameters of the network configuration. Um, you need to think about your interface card and where its interrupt, re interrupt requests are handled. You would like to try to put those on the same CPU that deals with your packet capture. Um, and you really need to think about bandwidth versus um, these I.O. operation per second. You know, bandwidth is very important. Um, but I think that sometimes the number of I.O. operations per second gets, gets overlooked, you know. So smaller packet sizes are, are very inefficient. You know, you can think about it in kind of the illogical extreme where you have a packet that contains 4,000 samples versus 4,000 packets that contain one sample. Dealing with one larger packet is much more efficiently. That's, that's, you can do one memory opt operation to copy that off rather than 4,000 very small operations. Um, and so this is probably more of a concern for systems that can be reconfigured and have these intermediate, intermediate and output formats where you want to packetize data. But it's something that you, you should keep in mind when designing this. Um, and then the final set of pro tips involve uh, multiple pipelines per node. So we're running three pipelines on each of uh, the LWA nodes. And so there is, you can segregate them on to CPUs and you can segregate the memory, but at some level they all are on the same system and there is some degree of interaction between them. Um, so obviously you have you know, core bindings. You want to make sure that you are putting individual blocks in different cores. Um, but on these multi-socket systems, um, you have you know, non-uniform memory access NUMA here concerns. So part of your RAM is located on one processor, and the other part is located on a different processor. And so if you want to access RAM on another processor, there is an additional overhead of having to go to the second processor and ask for um, some RAM that it has there. And so you want to be able to make sure that you do both core bindings and memory bindings to make sure that your memory is the closest memory you can get to your core for any of the CPU-based stuff. Um, and for these kind of multi-stage pipelines, you know, you need to consider, you know, where the breakpoint is and how you break it into different stages. So for our GX pipeline, we do the beam forming one place and then we do the T-engine operation somewhere else just so that we can free up cycles to run the core later um, and the other modes on there. So these are, these are things to, uh, to keep in mind. So um, I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes here talking about a future of Bifrost. Um, so as I mentioned a couple of times, the functionality is still growing. We're currently working on adding support for more packet formats and to make it easier for you to define custom packet formats and not only get the data into the system, but also output data in that packet format uh, relatively easy. Another big thing is that we're working on gridding and imaging. Um, so we're doing this from two different ways, both the classic kind of you form visibilities, you grid them on the UV plane and you do your inverse transform, as well as something called direct imaging where you skip the visibility step and you directly grid the electric fields that you see at each antenna, uh, which for some arrays is more e computationally efficient than doing standard FX correlation. Um, we just have this little example here. Uh, this is an image of the sky made in real time with 50 millisecond time steps and you kind of see this little blight meteor echo. Uh, pop up. And then, um, as I mentioned, Bifrost was really driven by the LWA, and LWA is driven by Bifrost. So moving forward, we have this, this technology concept called the LWA Swarm, uh, where the idea is that, you know, we all get together and we secure some funding for individual universities to build LWA-style stations. Maybe not full stations of 256 dipoles, but smaller ones of like 48, 64, whatever. And then by using the ability of the stations to do multiple um, operations at the same time, you provide this interesting new scientific, scientific capability. So you're getting these stations out to universities and giving them a hand at you know, starting up some kind of instrumentation program. And they can do their science, and we can also do our science by leveraging it together as an interferometer. Um, if you want to read more about it, we have this white paper submitted to the 2020 Decadal Survey that's um, available on the LWA website. And so and with that, um, I just want to leave up some links here to Bifrost, um, the documentation, a uh, copy of the paper on the archive and then the LWA site, and then the recent LWA users meeting, if anyone's curious about the science that, that people are currently doing. Thank you, James. Uh, do you have anything for Jace? We're a little bit ahead. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. I can't really get a sense of the scale of the operations here. Like, for instance, your typical ring buffer, mm -hmm. how, how big is your average ring buffer in seconds? And how um, is so the average ring buffer is about 10 spans, and a span is 20 milliseconds, so, you know, two-tenths of a second. 
So they're relatively small, um, both in terms of the time duration and the size. The, the exception is for the, uh, the TBF mode, where that is a five second buffer. And that buffer is in typically around, I think it's, it's about 600 megabytes per second. So it's a fairly sizable multi-gigabyte buffer there that we use. Uh, yep, please. Further, I had more of a comment. So mm -hmm. First up, this is amazing. I just started working at SMA and inherited a swarm system. <laughs> so a little overlap. But I was just wondering, with all of the open source community Casper hardware stuff, why there wasn't any further down the pipeline. Like you, you can capture other things that we could standardize and make diagnostic tools for it. So I'll, I'll be taking a look. Uh, but yeah, I just also wanted to point out that Swarm exists. Uh, I've been worked on it extensively. There's probably some overlap. Mm -hmm. we should talk about. And um, what do you use for persisting any of this data? Hmm? The, the larger chunks of data yeah. in this, if it gets persisted in this, what um, so we have these kind of packet-based data recorder systems downstream. And so we just stream out all the data and we only record when we have something interesting to record. So if there's an observation going on, we record the data. Otherwise, we just discard it. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a packet-based format. So we have a definition for what the packets contain and how large they are. So yeah. Um, so for that, you would take your data and you would send it to a repackatizer. And then that repackatizer would split it up into whatever that packet format was and then send it across the network where there would be another capture operation that received it and, and reordered it. Yeah, so you kind of have to kind of roll your own there. Uh, Jack is So there's a few pipelining engines available. We're about to hear about another one. David Man has Hashpipe, which I believe is based on something that came out of Guppy at the GBT before that, that was PSR data. This is probably going to turn into a working group question, but A, should we all be using the same one, which would be the kind of Casper thing to do, and do you think it's futile to try and make everyone use the same one? Um. So in my talk, I talked about familiarity. And I think that's a big thing that, that drives a lot of decisions, is how familiar you are with your pipeline. I mean, I think it'd be great if we could all unify behind some overall framework. You know, because one of the big things is that we implement what we need. You know, that, that may not necessarily overlap with what you need. And, and I think if we have collaborative development on a single pipeline, that provides the best, most flexible platform um, and provides also better documentation. So that's, one of the big struggles is getting people to do that. Yeah. So, so I guess related, what are the weaknesses of the um, um, So the, the very nice high level framework I showed you, um, you can use that for certain simple things. But if you want to do more complicated processing, involve monitor control, and really interleave things together, then you need to drop down to the kind of the Python binding layer and just above that. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times, you know, in, in terms of there's coverage, you know, in terms of what you have. Um, a lot of the CUDA code is, is very good code from Ben Sparsdell, who now works at NVIDIA. But we have not, you know, spent extensive time hand optimizing things. So it'd be easy to get something running. But if you really need to squeeze every ounce of performance out of your GPU, then you may need to end up rewriting, you know, particular kernels that are specific to your application. Out of the GPU computationally, or is this a matter of bandwidth? Um, I was thinking mainly GPU? more about the, the computational aspects of it, because it's easy to write CUDA code. It's more difficult to write CUDA code that is efficient and, and takes advantage of all the intricacies of GPU programming. So uh, we do have to move on to Andre's talk. Is your question quick? Um, <laughs> 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 so how scalable is Pyforce, for instance, is there any limitations in terms of bandwidth of your courses? Um, I'm looking at that, you know, say if you have an array of 246 elements and then you have a gigabit of bandwidth, would Pyforce scale up? Why did you have an effect? 
Um, I don't know, because part of the, the scaling depends on how you divvy up the work between the different servers in your system. You know, how much bandwidth is going to individual servers. Um, just to try to give you a reference, I don't really have any hard numbers, but what we've been able to achieve with the LWA is that on a single server, we've been able to ingest about 25 gigabits per second into the three pipelines there. And so that is, that's, that's a sixth of the, the 10 megahertz of bandwidth, so. Yeah, so it's just, just an idea of, of where we've been able to go with it. We haven't pushed much beyond that because we don't necessarily have anything that's currently driving us that far. Okay, uh, so thank you again, Jace.